Welcome to this new episode of our new look Brexit Business Show, coming to you now in both video and audio format. We're recording this on the 6th of October, just after the Conservative Party conference, so expect some lively comment in it. In today's show, Hugh Morgan Williams brings you his digest Hugh's News, Brexit News You Need to Know. Then Hugh and myself will have a news chat about a topical item from the news, which, hint, this episode is growth, growth, growth. <laughs> My Malcolm's monologue follows on from the chat as I introduce you to the elements of thrival. Yes, it's a word, and it's talking about velocity of growth. Following that comes our popular new feature called Focus On, where we take a country each episode and talk about the business opportunities and challenges in that country. This episode, it's a focus on the Republic of Ireland. The final segment, as in all our Brexit business shows, is our editorial comment called Hugh's View. Now, I have a notion he is going to be really to the point this episode. So let's get the show started with introducing Hugh and Hugh's News. Thank you, Malcolm. Um, this week, um, Liz Truss promises a bonfire of EU rules by the end of the year. Um, the protocol talks to do with Northern Ireland are to resume in an apparent spirit of willingness. Tensions mount over calls for increased migration to help with labour shortages, and farmers turn away from the Tories over Brexit. At her major conference speech in Birmingham this week, Liz Truss urged her party to seize the opportunities of Brexit and promised a bonfire of all EU rules by the end of the year. These commitments have been made before by senior Conservatives, but the task is such that all previous efforts have failed to deliver. EU rules are baked into our way of life, and it'll take much more than rhetoric by, to the party faithful for them to be implemented. Commentators are reminding the Prime Minister that new rules to be implemented next year will make crossing borders within the EU more difficult, not easier. Exporters face yet more paperwork, and the problems of the Northern Ireland Protocol remain, with legal action by the EU, EU getting ever closer. Keir Starmer's promising quick EU deals to unblock the situation, but currently he has no power or influence on the developing chaos. News this morning that the Protocol talks are to resume in two weeks' time between James Cleverley, the new Foreign Office Minister, and Mara Sefcevic. Get my tongue around that one again. Um, and uh, in addition to that, Liz Truss is off to Prague this morning um, for a new EU grouping of EU group leaders. It's been uh, suggested by President Macron, and Liz Truss has said, I hope it's more than just a talking shop. Well, maybe she should think of rejoining the EU then. But in any, in any event, there, are, there is movement, uh, and it's, I, I'm pleased to be able to report that. Another point of tension was revealed at the Tory party conference. Whilst Liz Truss argued for liberation of migrant rules to unblock labour shortages and fuel growth, yes, you guessed it, Home Secretary Suella Braverman called for an end to mass migration and promised to revisit student numbers and low-skill immigration. This has already drawn howls of protest from both within and outside the party. Lord Johnson, Boris's brother, said the British higher education system was one of the few globally competitive industries we have left, and an assault on overseas students would be completely counterproductive. She's also calling for a complete ban on granting asylum to any cross-channel migrants, at the same time promising extension to the Rwanda scheme. It's reported this week that farmers are beginning to flex their muscles over apparent government indifference to their plight. YouGov is reporting that 41% of farmers would now vote Labour, up from 24% in August. Most farms have high debts, spiralling interest charges, diesel fuel price increases and, co and rises in the cost of fertiliser are hitting them hard. Their productivity is plummeting, with Brexit-induced labour shortages preventing them from harvesting their crops. The new agriculture minister told them this week they could now sell chickens to Mongolia. But that's a challenge with avian flu. 
and uncertainty over post-Brexit subsidy schemes based on stewardship, not productivity, are causing concern. The Prime Minister says food security is vital, but farmers are being urged to compete in global markets where cheap imports do not conform to our welfare standards. The government's response is for farmers to stick a union jack on their products to distinguish it from the competition. There's horror too in the conservation sector, where developers are being told they can build in national parks or wildlife sites if those are within a development zone. The National Trust, RSPB and the Wildlife Trust are united in their opposition. And the final insult to the rural poor? A £100 contribution to households for their heating oil. Thanks, you. I'm, I'm, I'm always, I was despairing before we start our news chat. In her party conference speech, Liz Truss said she had three objectives and they were growth, growth, growth. Now, almost every PM says that and every business leader wants it. But as an experienced business leader yourself, have we in the UK got the right entrepreneurial flair and situation at the moment to achieve growth? Or is it just that we're listening to, as you called it before, party rhetoric well um i think liz truss has committed herself to a growth path but she's committed herself to a growth path in a rather controversial way um she started off with tax cuts funded by borrowing now she's quite keen on quoting mrs thatcher um, and mrs thatcher was well known for cutting taxes but she never borrowed to achieve that it was all uh, she had some pretty tough budgets in the early years of her premiership, uh, and those were the ones that were used to fuel the later tax cuts because we were paying our way in the world, as she put it. So uh, this is a different growth strategy. It's funded by borrowing, and at some point that borrowing is going to have to be paid back. So the growth ambition is is pretty big, um, and she will be looking at all measures to try and fuel growth. And, you know, one of her ideas is to uh, reward the wealthy um, because they will start new businesses and employ more people and so on. Well, there's no evidence to suggest that that will happen. Mm. So I think there are lots and lots of questions about the new strategy. And I think there is also a feeling that it's unfair that um, people at the lower end of the income scale, what are they going to get? A 1p cut in income tax. Well, if you're earning a million pounds, um, you're currently £50,000 better off than you were a week ago. And I think the British sense of fair play is beginning to uh, come into play and think, well, hang on a minute, that's just, not, that's just not on. And you can see from the splits in the cabinet that indeed conservatives are beginning to wonder where this is going to go. No. Um, what did uh, Nadine Doris say? Um, we, we face wipeout at the next election unless Liz Truss has a U-turn. Well, she's U-turned over the top rate of tax, the 45 pence rate, but she's showing no sign of U-turning over anything else. Uh, and I think the jury's going to be out on really whether this uh, this new strategy and new policy is going to work. Mm. I, I listened to her speech at a Conservative Party conference and I was um, underwhelmed. Uh, I, it there's no motivation with it within it, and it's too much all about um, personal. You know, you just feel that that she's not with you. She's not with you. I there is no empathy, is there? There is no, no. Uh, there there is no um, feeling that I am on your side. It's during her interview on on the Laura Koonsberg show. Um, she was very keen on wagging her finger. And it was almost as if, you know, you were a naughty boy in the classroom yeah. listening mm -hmm. to the head teacher. And that kind of approach isn't going to work. I mean, none of us like being told what to do, particularly by someone who isn't prepared to identify with the problems that the nation faces. Mm. I, I think, you know, this I keep going back to Thatcher and everything. We're in a different world now because when Thatcher was around, you and I were were working or trying to work but you know we didn't have the opportunities of the digital world that we're in now we couldn't reach those countries as easy as we can do we couldn't experience and 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 
and find new ways of growth as much as it can. So are we right to think back to Thatcher? I think in some ways we're right to think back to Thatcher because there was determination and single-mindedness, which I think are, are, are all good good things to do. But you had to wear out your shoe leather to actually increase your sales. Mm. I mean, I remember going around Eastern Europe and uh, trying to establish new markets there. And the internet was very much in its early days. And even today, people actually want to meet you yes. and shake your hand and look you in the eye before they really want to do business with you. Those mm. things haven't changed. Those things haven't changed. Yes, air travel. Air travel might have uh, slowed down a bit and all the rest of it. But the requirement to actually meet your customer, meet your supplier is there because a lot hangs on it. And um, mm -hmm. this is something that, that still needs to be done. COVID didn't help, of course, with all that. And, and now we're into a, an era of, well, a lower exchange rate. But is that really helping um, uh, companies export their goods when international supply chains have taken over? And, for example, mm -hmm. um, take... The, the, for example, the cost of a Mini, more than half the Mini is made up of imported parts, which will cost more due to the decline in the value of the pound. So the, the, the decline in the value of the pound isn't helping as much as it should in terms of boosting our export business. Mm. A, f a quick yes or no then, Hugh. Do you feel that the image of the um, United Kingdom is being impaired dramatically? I think there are still a, there's, there's still a lot going for the UK. I mean, I think um, its principal support for Ukraine has gone a long way to um, mm -hmm. help and encourage our, our allies. Uh, but I think when we come to talking about our policies in relation to our friends and neighbours in Europe, I think Britain's taken a huge hit, huge hit in reputational damage. And I think it'll take some considerable time to get over it. I mean, there was a wonderful quote from Gerald Ratner some decades ago now where yeah. he described, he described his, his jewellery as tat. Yeah. And he confessed afterwards, he said, it takes 30 years to build a business and 10 seconds to wreck it. Yeah. And I think that's, that's really part of the problem. We, we know that to build successful businesses takes a long time when that success mm -hmm. can so easily be damaged and ruined. Without a doubt. Thank you, Hugh. Thanks, Hugh. And now for my pre-recorded Malcolm's monologue. Over my career, I've worked through many tough times helping businesses not just survive, but thrive. Now, to many in the present challenging situation, that may seem beyond achievement. But my experience is that taking time to follow a process will help you see and seize opportunity. My BBTV Thrival programme gives you an essential set of steps to follow. Now, Thrival is a real word that means growth velocity. Let me take you through it, as you can see on the screen. Step one, it's important to not panic and don't rush into shotgun action, which can cause even bigger problems. Step back and closely analyse the situation. Be curious, ask questions of customers, suppliers, your people. Do the sums and know the true impact on your business of the present situation and the likely upcoming situation. Step two, it's time to evaluate opportunity. At tough times, there is always opportunity to be pursued. Some of the world's biggest companies like Disney, Uber, Kraft, Microsoft, Pizza Hut, Adobe were all formed in a downturn. The key is to know your customers needs and how you can satisfy them. And this is where your team strength can come in as you say blue sky ideas together. Step three is to take determine your thrival strategy along with both realistic and stretch the velocity goals. Make sure your team get buy-in and ensure the, they know the part that they will pay in the success of your thrival strategy. Step four, and it's time to create an implementation plan. 
Now, many businesses have a strategy, but around 90% fail to create an implementation plan and execute it. Do remember, it's likely that your competitors will have followed the usual approach of cutting back on selling, cutting back on marketing, cutting out training. Wow, what an opportunity. And it doesn't have to cost you a lot. It doesn't have to cost you a lot with today's new sales and marketing tools. I explain this more in my Thrival Coaching. Step five is the all important execution of the plan. Now, do pay attention to detail here and get your team to take ownership of their part in the execution. Ensure you stress to them that they will not be criticized for any failure and to use their creativity as much as possible in the execution of the plan. Motivate and incentivize them. And step six is the all important action of monitoring, measuring and adjusting your thrival activity. With continuing uncertainty facing us around the world, you need to embed in your culture that you just cannot set a plan to go and leave it to achieve. So adopt what I said in step one and be constantly curious as to how it's performing. Now that's my six step thriver plan. It's not revolution in it, revolutionary in its steps and neither should it be at these times of change. But it does put the all important process into seeing and seizing your opportunity. Check out BVTV Thrival at bizvision.co.uk for more support. It's time now for our new feature, Focus On. With this episode, it's Focus On Ireland. Hugh, I'm a regular Zoom visitor for BVTV to the hotbed of technology in Dublin, but your mind, what's the general export opportunity that the Republic of Ireland offers? You know, Ireland is a, is a bit of an enigma, really. <clears throat> it's a small country um, with a tiny population in relation to the UK. Uh, and yet it's our sixth most important export market. Um, every year, um, in terms of visible goods, we sell about £22 billion pounds worth of goods to the Republic of Ireland, and we export about the same in terms of services, legal, le um, accountancy, uh, PR, um, all, kinds of, all kinds of different uh, services that we, we, we supply, consultancy and so on. So it is a big market for the UK, um, and in return, Ireland exports about £20 billion to us. So we have a budgetary surplus with Ireland, which um, we can't say about some other countries. That's a good thing. And they've been, you know, long-standing trade partners going back decades since, in fact, Ireland was part of the UK uh, over 100 years ago. So it's important in terms of what we export. Um, well, we export a lot of um, things like construction machinery, um, heavy engineering goods, um, pharmaceuticals. Um, and also, uh, they, of course, export a lot of agricultural products to us. I mean, half the UK's consumption of beef actually comes from, from Ireland, Irish beef. Um, and that, of course, is, is redolent by uh, the fact that uh, since we had um, a problem over our beef some years ago, continental markets have increasingly turned to Irish beef as a, as a good alternative. Um, someone once said that Ireland's best export was grass. Um, because they've got a, they, they have a, a benign climate in terms of rainfall, um, and it's an ideal, uh, ideal country to um, to grow um, grass, which means that uh, animals eat grass. So dairy, meat, all those kind and derivatives. So all those kinds of things um, are, are, are way up there. There is, however, a, a bit of a unique situation with Ireland since Brexit. The, the statistics are all over the place. We're not selling as much there. Ireland is trying to actually find alternative supplies within the EU. Um, and so that's that damaging our export markets. In the meantime, our um, imports from Ireland have rocketed up. Um, so Ireland's doing very well. Um, and also, of course, we've got this peculiar situation in Northern Ireland, which is still part of the EU single market for customs purposes. So 
there's, a, there's a, within the figures there's lots of distortion by what's going to Northern Ireland that is eventually going to Ireland and what is coming into Northern Ireland from Ireland that is eventually destined for the EU. No one seems to have got a handle on those kinds of figures. But certainly, it's a friendly market. They speak the same language as we do. Um, they have some, some curious customs um, in, 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 in trade terms, which we all know about. Um, I mean, there was one famous occasion I remember ringing up a, a, an Irish customer and saying, um, you're a bit overdue with your, with your, um, with your payments. And the guy at the other said, oh, I'm terribly sorry about that. He said, but the guy who writes the checks has broken his finger. <laughs> so so uh, I, I, then, I then said, well, he can write checks with his toes, can't he? Yeah. And this caught the days when people still wrote checks. Um, and, um, it, it, you know, there are, there are definitely customs in, in Ireland which you need to be aware of when you embark on a, on a trade relationship. Um, they're quite tough negotiators. Um, mm -hmm. But they're very friendly, and and I think it's it was no um, it was no surprise when Ireland won the Eurovision Song Contest three three years in a row. I think at the end the Irish government was saying, "Please, someone else win because it's costing us too much money." Yes. Yeah. But uh, Ireland is is a friendly country, and also increasingly a pivotal country in relation to um, the European Union. Mm. Um, and they do feel they are at the centre of the negotiations between Britain and the EU over what happens in terms of exports, even fish. Uh, we do export a lot of fish to Ireland, by the way. Mm. Um, and, and I think it's, it's those, it's that kind of pivotal negotiating position and diplomacy where Ireland is very much at the centre of Europe at the moment. And I think that's that's quite interesting. I think mm. we're in a position where we can capitalise on that. Um, but we need to be a bit more assertive, I think, in developing those export markets with Ireland because Ireland could well be a gateway to the EU in a way that it's never been before. Yes. Uh, fascinating. Every time I'm doing an interview in America, uh, the, for example, this week talking to uh, uh, a gentleman at the University of Chicago, and uh, also one University of Massachusetts, or all been recently to Ireland uh, exploring opportunity um, because they see it as very much an affinity with them and an opportunity and an opportunity there. So we've really got to get our, our sex selves been much more entrepreneurial in Ireland, haven't we? We do indeed. I, I mean, a, a friend of mine who um, runs a a pharmaceutical business. He got a, an EU loan, of, um, some millions of euros, on condition that he relocated his business to Dublin. Mm -hmm. They wouldn't give him the money if he was still located in this country. And I think that, that actually says quite a lot about what kinds of opportunities might present themselves in the future. Yes. Yeah. And just look at the amount of USA companies based in Dublin, like Adobe, for example, uh, Salesforce, and that it's huge amount of uh, of businesses see um, Ireland as a great opportunity. So thanks, Hugh, for all of that. And let's hope that we can, um, we've stimulated people. Well, I'm stimulated and my surname's Gallagher, so I'm, I'm all right there, aren't I? But uh, let's stimulate them to go and talk to our great friends in Ireland start some business relationships. Now, as always, no Brexit business show would be complete without our to the point Hughes view. So over to you, Hugh. Thanks, Malcolm. Well, the Conservative Party conference has certainly dominated the headlines this week, and it's exhibited a number of divisions in our government from right at the top to the bottom. From rows and that U-turn over the top rate of tax to disagreement over updating benefits in line with inflation, disagreements in levels of migration and what it means by the Brexit dividend. In particular, how will the government try and balance the books after that great tax giveaway? I would venture to suggest that voters are bewildered by government. Strikes rack the economy from rail workers to barristers and there's potentially more to come from teachers and health workers. Inflation is gobbling up our earnings. Interest rates on the rise with a significant fall in property values now being talked about. 
and anger that the government appears to be cutting taxes for the wealthy with little available for the average earner. So where has the notion of the one nation conservative gone? From jingoism to ideology, from Brexit purity to economic competence, and now potential partiality to different sectors of our population. We are all confused. Where has the notion of fairness gone? What is the future of our once great country? I don't have any answers. All I can do is pose the questions. Thanks, Hugh. I always enjoy listening to your Hugh's view because it comes from the heart. But I think this is one of your best views. And um, I resonate totally with everything you said within there, especially all the confusion. We trust you've enjoyed this post-Conservative Party conference episode of the Brexit Business Show. Yes, as businesses, we have headwinds to contend with. Yes, but there's bountiful uncertainty around. But don't forget... In troubling times, some of the biggest businesses like Uber, Netflix, Disney even, all were formed. Get some innovative thinking going until our next episode. And there's a new episode, don't forget, every fortnight. And next time, our focus on country will be Poland. Thanks for watching or listening. Do get in touch with us, mg, mg at bizvision.co.uk, mg at bizvision.co.uk, if you'd like us to cover any subject. Bye for now.